You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have Susanna Kearsley on the show with me. She has an amazing new book. It's called The Vanished Days. It's book three in the Scottish series. Um, but if you're like me and... and, uh, and wasn't completely up to speed on the series you can grab this book and and jump in um and and have a a perfectly fine time with the story it's so immersive and and you're going to love it and then like me you'll want to go back and grab the other books and 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 get up to speed that way um i love this book so much i'm recommending it to everyone welcome to the show susanna oh thanks so much hank thank you for having me it's wonderful to be here I'm excited to have you. Uh, Susanna, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? I've got kind of a – it's interesting because I got sort of a memory that's – I like to say it's a little bit like um, an epiphany more than a memory of wanting to be, Um, and I liken it to – I don't know if you've ever heard – um, Martin Sheen talk about his childhood memory of growing up in, you know, kind of like a small, I think you grew, grew up in the Midwest and, and he talks about, you know, having felt so different from all the other children and not quite knowing right. why he felt so different. And his parents took him to, to the movies one time and when he was young and he looked up at the screen and saw the actors on the screen and he suddenly got this feeling like, that's it. That's what I am. That's what I am. (laughs) And it was like this wave of like, Oh my gosh, I'm not crazy. I'm one of them. And, um, and I had a sort of similar feeling when I picked up uh, little women um, by Louisa May Alcott would have been around seven. I think I would have been around seven. Um, And I first uh, read the character of Joe in Little Women. And Joe, you know, for people that aren't familiar with the book, if there is anybody that isn't familiar with the story, (laughs) um, there are probably a few out there. Uh, Joe is is a character who just loves writing, telling stories. And and it was the moment when Joe went up to the attic uh, and she had like a little basket of apples and she had her scratchy pen and she was just writing stories. And I thought, that's what I am. That's, this is me. This is what I want to do. This is what I, I, you know, I am a storyteller. I want to do this. I I just want to do that. And I had been writing stories and telling stories and making stories up and writing very bad poetry and and inflicting it on my family and um, always writing the first chapter of something and sitting at the kitchen table while my mom was making dinner and writing first chapters on my school paper and stuff like that. But I really didn't know that this was a thing, that this was, I mean, I, I, I lived at that time in a very small town in, uh, uh, in Ontario, um, in Canada. And, you know, we didn't have writers in my very small town. <laughs> writers were these, you know, mythical creatures that lived in New York or Toronto and they dressed in black and they were very angsty and, and, you know, it, it, it just wasn't, you know, we didn't have that. Um, so to see this character in a book that was just, like me and realized that's what I was, um, was this, it was epiphany moment for me. Um, so that from that moment was kind of the first memory I have of, of feeling that I was normal, that what I was doing was something normal. And that's, you know, it was, it was, it, epiph- epiphany is really the only feeling I, or the only word that I can find for it. Um, it wasn't a moment of, you know, this is what I want to do. It was more a moment of this is what I am. The fact that you stand in a room and you're always watching, you're always, um, that then that's okay. You know, you notice things that other people don't notice and that's okay. Um, you make up stories around everything and, and that's okay uh, because there are other people out there in the world that are just like you. The the reason I phrase that first question the way I do about your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller 
is because um, if you have that storyteller gene or, or whatever, whatever it is that that makes us the, the way that we are, um, th- there comes a point where it um, telling stories is one thing, writing books and selling them, you know, at market to to the rest of the world. That's kind of a different thing. A lot of times there's there's a lot of overlap there and and one right. usually leads to the other. And and I think most people want one to lead to the other, but they don't necessarily have to. Um, right. I, I remember having a conversation with Brandon Sanderson, the the fantasy writer, and he was talking about the fact that he had written 13 novels, I believe it was, before he sold the first one. And uh, and and I asked him, you know, well, what would have happened if you had not sold that 13th novel? And he said, well, my children were going to, you know, when when I was old and, and passed away, they were going to inherit a, a house full of books that I had written <laughs> because I was going to write books, you know, right. whether whether someone wanted to, you know, buy them from me and publish them. You know, that's kind of a whole separate thing. Um, but I am a writer. And exactly. I love that when people have that epiphany and, and, and even, and I know that you, um, you had other jobs and pursued other things, uh, but you were a writer who happened to work in a museum at one point, right? Right. I, w- I was a museum curator um, and I loved it. I did love it. And I, I also just getting back to what you just said. I mean, I always try to tell people that will come up to me and say, well, I'm an aspiring writer. I try to say, well, the first thing you need to do is knock that aspiring off your handle um because i don't believe there is any such thing as an aspiring writer i think if you if you process life through story um through words um then you're a writer and like you say whether you get published or not whether those stories stay under your bed or or um in your mind or you know just whether you're you know some people some people are oral storytellers and and you know, it's how you process life, right? It's, it's, right. it's, it's in you and it, you're a writer and, you know, the, the sooner that, that you believe that yourself and allow yourself to, to sort of own that, um, you know, the, the outside world isn't, that's something the outside world can't take away from you, whether you right. get published or not. And you're, you're still a writer. It's what you are. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I didn't think it was something I was going to make money out of. Um, I, you know, you dream that you can. Um, it certainly was was the dream, but uh, I, I had a more practical side that uh, thought that I should probably pay my rent, and my bills with something <laughs> else. Um, and I, I love things tend to get in the way of life. They don't do, they? and I, I have a lot of loves. I mean, and, and it, things that I love in life, and and one of them was history. Um, and I kind of stumbled sideways into museum work. It was one of my first student jobs was working in a museum. Um, and I, I went through university for, um, politics and, and international development. That wasn't a great fit. So I ended up working in a museum again, uh, in a job that, that kind of led me into, uh, working as a curator for, a. um, a community museum which had 12 buildings on two and a half acres and I just absolutely loved it I loved the community I worked in um and the thing was I, I started working on a novel my sister had dared me to finally finish a novel during that period um because I was showing her the first chapters all the way through my 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 life really but all the way through especially my teenage years when I started more seriously working on my writing, um, I would show my sister the first chapter of everything I was working on and she would read it. She was my, the only person I would really show other than teachers. Um, and she would hand the first chapter back to me and she would say, that's wonderful. That's great. And I would, you know, feel all puffed up with pride because my sister loved it. And, but then I would put it back in sort of the, the drawer box full of first chapters and I would go on to work on the next work um and show her the next first chapter for the next big thing and and she would say that's great that's wonderful finally she got sick of doing this and when i was working in the museum (laughs) um she handed me back a first chapter and she said it's it's great i love it finish it and i kind of went what 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 and and she said finish it she said i i bet you can't i i dare you to finish it and i went oh and she said, I, I, I dare you to finish it by Labor Day. And this was Easter. 
ish when I handed it to her. And Labor Day for anybody that's listening that is not North American is like September 1st. So we didn't have that much time. And but she knew that I, I'm a little competitive and I can't resist a dare. And the bet she bet me was dinner at the Grand Concourse restaurant in Pittsburgh, where she was living then. And it was a really expensive restaurant and I couldn't afford it. So I had to win the bet. Um, <laughs> and I went to my library and I pulled out the first book on writing that I could find, which happened to be Phyllis A. Whitney's Guide to Fiction Writing, which was a really, really fortuitous find because it was pretty dummy proof from, you know, it was a very, very good guide on on how to write your first novel and get all the way through it. Um, and I finished the book. And I think what my sister knew was what was holding me back is the same thing that holds a lot of us back when we tackle our first novel. I don't know if you encountered this when you finally got through your first work of fiction, because I know you've written several. But when you get through the first one, a lot of the time you get you get to that point in the middle where and I still do this after I don't know, I'm on like my 15th book now after 26, 27 years in this business. And I still hit that point in the middle where I think it's garbage. I think it's absolute <laughs> garbage. I'm going to put it in the, you know, in in the bin and I've lost all my talent. Nobody's ever going to want to publish me again. It's not up to my usual standard. It's terrible. And I should just get to work on the next thing. And I hit that point with the first book. I hit that point with every Thing I had started up to then and what was stopping me was absolute fear the first times um, because I wanted to succeed so badly I really wanted to write my first novel so badly I wanted to be a writer so badly and I think I was just so scared that if I really tried I would find out that I couldn't I would find out that I didn't actually have that in me and it was the fear that was holding me back. So my sister's bet was the thing that got me over the mountain of that fear because I had no option. I had to plow through. I had to win that bet. I had to get to the end, even if it was the worst thing I'd ever written. I had to get past that fear. And when I got past that fear and I got to the end, I realized two things. One, you can you can revise anything as long as it's on the page. Right. But if it's not on the page, you can't fix it. And two, when you finish something, it's never as bad as you think it's going to be. <laughs> you get back over it. You think that's not half bad. Um, and I had I had broken through that and I had finished my first novel. And I think my sister knew that inside um, that all I needed to do was get through one and it would break the chain of that fear. And that was my second epiphany as a writer. And. I then had a problem because I was working as a museum curator and it's very difficult to do a nonprofit job and write because nonprofit takes up so much of your time. Right. You have these crazy evening hours. I was I wrote the first book from like, I think, 10 o'clock at night to two o'clock in the morning. And you can't really do that in a sustainable um, job for very long without, you know, losing your health. So I was very, very very fortunate in a way that a lot of writers are not um, in that my parents offered me the chance to move back home with them and take up one of their bedrooms. And I was in my mid twenties at this point. So I moved back home. They gave me my room of my own and I waitressed for five years and um, paid the rent with, you know, my waitressing and I traveled and I wrote, and I finished um, my novel, Mariana, while I was living in their house. And that was kind of the one that opened all the doors for me. That was the one I sent off to a competition in for unpublished novels in the UK. And it won. And it that just kind of, that was the beginning of everything for me in 1993. Authors. I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, 
to have a great looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy to use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. What Death Taught Tarrant by Derek McFadden. Life is a journey. So is the afterlife. At the end of his life, Terrence McDonald must discover its meaning or he'll be banned from the afterlife forever and his soul will cease to exist. Join Terrence and those who love him on a poignant and unforgettable journey through a life at once wonderful and harrowing. Learn what Terrence learned. See what Terrence sees. By this provocative story's end, readers may even learn a thing or two about themselves. See why people are saying things like, Derek McFadden writes with an insight you can match. If you like the works of Mitch Album, I think you'll find What Death Taught Terrence a worthy addition to your library and the reading of it, a life-affirming journey. I found the story immediately immersive and it stuck with me long after I finished. What Death Taught Terrence by Derek McFadden on sale now. From uh, someone who habitually wrote first chapters and, and never got any deeper, that challenge from your sister um, really made you uh, kind of confront your fear and and to to work through that there's something about a, a, a lot of people can write a great first chapter it's 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 kind of easy to come up with a hook um and which is you know what a lot of first chapters are it's kind of the setup and the the tease that, that makes you want to dive into the story and follow these characters where they lead you um but it's a whole other thing to to keep digging and to to actually follow them and and that did in that process of going through that first novel and getting to the end um what did you learn uh, other than you know just facing your fear um what was it um that that you feel like was holding you back what were you scared of i guess is the question i mean that that you just weren't good enough like that that you couldn't finish yeah, it yeah i was scared that well i was scared that i didn't have the well i didn't know the craft um, cause it's a craft yeah. and I had no, I mean, this is 1991 when I was writing that first novel, 1991, 1992. Um, we're talking a time before the, you know, like the internet is not widely, it's not where you went to get stuff, right? Like I was doing, you know, when I had to do historical research, you still went and sat your butt in the library to get your historical research. You know, you didn't, right. you didn't Google stuff. Um, wasn't that easy. Um, I lived in a small town. I didn't have access to writers groups. I didn't go, I didn't go to a writer's conference until I was much, much older. Um, I, you know, I had none of those connections. I didn't know any writers. I didn't know anybody. Um, I didn't know agents or publishers or anybody that could hook me up with anything. I didn't know where to turn for any of this information. Um, my, my, information on how to write came from you know the the um writer's handbook 
um, that used to be published by the writer magazine. They would publish these big, thick writer's handbook things with a, a bunch of articles that came out of the writer magazine written by different writers. And those are still my favorite writing guides, the ones that have a bunch of different articles by different people, um, because you're going to find something by somebody that speaks to you that that has a little bit of advice because there's, you know, like, you know, yourself, the, the one thing about writing is there's no right way to do it. You're going to everybody has their own their own way of of doing something and you you pick and and find all kinds of advice and little bits and tips and techniques from all kinds of different people that, that help you at different stages of your career and with different books you might need a I, I liken it to to carpentry right like when you're it, it's a craft like like the carpenter's craft and when you start out you are the raw apprentice and you have no idea what you're doing and you if you have to build a chest of drawers you have no idea what you're doing and and all you do is you you start with the 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 plans and your chest of drawers looks like crap and as you go along you learn better how to dovetail things and how to you know how to make it look smoother and how to make those drawers go in and out better and and as you get going then you start putting your own touches on it and you start turning the legs a little better and you start making everything look a little nicer and by the time you've been at it for a little while you are producing pieces of furniture that people know were produced by you because they've got your mark on it right. and you know it, that it, it's a craft but at the beginning you have no clue and your <laughs> chest of drawers is going to be a copy of someone else's chest of drawers and it's right. going to look a lot like someone else's chest of drawers and that's just what writing is um so i give a lot of credit to that that phyllis a whitney book that i picked up the guide to fiction writing which you can still get off the internet um because she she led you through things like how to get through that big black hole in the middle of the book, which I had never faced before, that big black <laughs> cavern of how do you pull a plot through from that, you know, that first idea of the opening. Like you say, the opening's easy, right? Getting your characters yeah. together is, you know, is is easy. But how do you pull them through a plot? And she broke it down into the, you know, the very easy steps of like, you know, the problem, the purpose, the goal, and just and just, you know, pull them through it that way. Like have them face the problem and they're either going to solve the problem or they're not going to solve the problem. And if they solve the problem, then they produce another problem that you have to, you know, it, it, just pulling them through the plot in little easy steps. And it's like a marathon and you're you're just looking at your feet the whole way through. Um, so that was the way I got through that first book. And now I'm a, I mean, I'm a, I'm a pantser. I don't even look anymore. I just go. Um, <laughs> I just, you know, the, the first time I was so scared, I just kind of, I, I plotted everything out and I, I had no idea what I was doing. And now I just throw the characters on the page and they, they just go where they want to go. And it's a lot more fun. Um, so it's, uh, it's a craft. And I think you just, you just have to have the, the bravery to, to kind of, um, Earl Stanley Gardner once said that, you know, when, when something scares the pants off you, you just like, you know, you just have to step off the, the bank of the mi mixing metaphors like crazy, but you know, you, you have to step when, when, when something frightens you, you step off the bank of the river and you wait out and you face it. You don't, um, right. You don't just stand there and watch it go by. And um, I, you know, I, I think you have to do that all the time in writing, and you have to do that continually through your career. And that's what you have. That's what keeps you leveling up. I think right. you know, like with every book, you want to try to take on something that scares you, something that you think, I don't know what I'm doing in this book. Um, even in the vanished days taking on a male first person voice was something I had never done before. And initially I thought there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. I can't write as a man. I can't do it. And then, and then you just have to wait off that bank and try it. Right. Right. Um, well, speaking of mixing metaphors and, and not that you mix metaphors, but um, you, your books um, and, and since the, the 1990s, when you're talking about when you, uh, when your writing career really took off, um, you have uh, carved out a, a niche in in the um, in, in in the historical fiction genres, but 
your books are kind of more than that. And and you like to mix genre uh, in wow. the way that we mix metaphors a lot of times. <laughs> your books are a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And, and um, you know, they don't fit anywhere. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, they're, they're not a tidy fit, you know, but yeah. your, your books could be found over here. And, you know, if you're walking through the bookstore or, or over here or, you know, maybe we just need a bookshelf that's that's just for Susanna Kearsley books. Um, but have you but all of all of your books, from what I can tell, are historical fiction or um, fit sort of that way. Had, going back to that first book, what, was that what you began with? Were, were you always intrigued with uh with telling stories of the past i was always intrigued with telling romantic suspense that where the characters had to deal with mysteries that came out of the past so there was always a historical element to the mystery and a love story wrapped up in it so there's no part of that that you can really remove without the whole thing falling apart you can't take out the history right. or the story falls apart you can't take out the mystery or the story falls apart you can't <laughs> take out the love story or the story falls apart and it always has to have a happy ending because i just you know i i'm i'm just a happy ending girl so um, life's too short to not have well happy it's just endings. it's it's also realistic um you know like i my parents met each other when they were 15 and 16. they're in their early 80s now they still hold hands um their lives have had their ups and downs. Um, you know, they've raised two daughters, lost one daughter, um, but they still hold hands. And you will never convince me that a happy ending or a romance is unrealistic. It's just, it's, to me, love, finding love, remembering love, seeking love, holding on to love is, is the core of what humans do in life. Right. And, you know, whenever anybody comes at me and says that, you know, oh, well, you know, like everything's fine except the romance bit. It's like, well, yeah, but that's what makes us human. That's what I I can't think of any great story in any genre that I've read, whether it's science fiction or fantasy or mystery or, you know, any genre, even litvic, um, that has not contained a, a an epic love story. Um you know, the, that's to me what makes the human aspect of us, um, Absolutely. you know, valuable. And uh, I still remember when they interviewed Jimmy Carter uh, a few years back and, and they were, you know, trying to get a political answer from him on like, you know, what is the most important thing you've ever done with your life? And he said, marrying Rosalind. Right. And, you know, it's that's what makes us human. And I, I would imagine it probably that's what makes a lot of the animal kingdom move um if we were able to understand their language a little bit better than we do it's not just a human thing it's what motivates most of nature but um it's uh so it you're right it crosses a lot of genres my husband always used to say that that my books are kind of like old hitchcock movies that they've got a lot of a lot of stuff going on you know there's a little bit of paranormal sometimes in the books a little bit of woo woo a little bit of um a little bit of mystery, a little bit of romance and, and stuff, but it's all mixed up. Um, it's a marketer's nightmare. The marketing department, <laughs> every publisher I've ever had just like, you know, probably drinks heavily um, trying to figure out where to put me. And it makes it difficult for me also to fit into different um, organizations that you join me. If you're, if you're, you know, a member of the Mystery Writers of America, you're not totally a Mystery Writer of America, but, you know, you, you feel like you belong. Um, because I do write mystery and I do write romance and I do write historical. It's just I, I write a different spin on everything. Um, I, I'm kind of like a I'm like a cockapoo mixed with a labradoodle in it, when it comes to like fiction. <laughs> right? you know, but but it, it's an interesting thing because the the one theme of all my books, if you want to think of it, is um, and I think this comes from the fact that. Me and my dad was an engineer who moved around to a lot of different job sites when I was growing up. So so we were constantly moving from place to place to place. And the theme of my books is my characters are always looking for that place where they belong, where they fit in. Um, 
they're always an outsider, almost always an outsider coming into a community and looking for where they belong. Um, and it's 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 kind of an irony that you know I myself as a writer <laughs> don't really belong in any one um, writing community. Um, but my hope is that eventually, even if it's after I die, that my that I will be embraced by a number of them that they will want to claim me and say, oh, well, she's one of us. You know, she's a mystery writer or she's a romance writer or she's a fantasy writer or she's a this or she's a that. Um, you know, that that would be nice. I would like that. Absolutely. Um, when I first saw The Vanished Days, um, the, one of the first things I noticed um, besides this gorgeous cover um, was uh, the the cover blurb was written by Diana Gabaldon. Um, yeah. Who who knows a little something about writing stories that don't fit in any one genre? You know, if you've ever tried to recommend the Outlander series to to someone, you know, good luck um, telling them what the story is about and what genre it is, because uh, you know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm still at a loss. Um, but um, the the vanished days the, is the book three in the Scottish series. Um, what what is this series about, and it's, and where are you taking us? Okay, well, a couple of things in there. I have to thank Phase Out Studios for the cover design and source books. I mean, it, I can't take any credit for that whatsoever. It's a beautiful, beautiful cover, and I absolutely I gasped when I saw it because to me it looks like a painting. It's just yeah, it's stunning. Um, Diana Gabaldon has been. I, there are no words for what Diana Gabaldon has been um, in my life. She, um, we uh, met each other in person probably about 11 years ago through the um, the Surrey International Writers Conference, where we go, we both go every year to present. And she is just the most generous, uh, warmest, um, most yeah, just most giving person um, that that I know in, in, in the writing uh, field, um, For sure. you know, it, both she and, and Ian Rankin have, have just been absolutely wonderful to me um, throughout my career. Um, um, so, yeah, and, and the fact that she, you know, that she likes my books is just, is, <laughs> that's, is that's you know, I don't, no, she's just, she's wonderful. And she's, and not just to me, she's like that with, with unpublished writers as well. I have seen her be, tremendous with unpublished writers um the scottish series okay so the scottish series is, is the names of the series both you'll see it called the slain series on goodreads and the scottish series elsewhere the names of the series are are exterior names that were the slain series was was given it by readers on goodreads which is fine readers can readers are allowed to do what readers want to do because once the book leaves me it's it belongs to the readers um and on goodreads readers like to be able to categorize things to let you know what belongs together on their bookshelves um and i wrote a book called the winter sea and then wrote a sort of sequel companion book to the winter sea that follows the, it continues the historical story because it's a dual time novel. Um, both both novels are dual time novels. So the historical story of the Winter Sea continues in my book, The Firebird, but they have different present day stories. Um, so the readers on Goodreads decided to link those two stories together in what they called the Slains series. Slains being the name of the castle that was right. featured in the Winter Sea. My publisher, Sourcebooks, has decided that since this novel, this novel is a sort of, I call, I would call it a sort of prequel, not a full prequel, but a sort of prequel companion novel to the Winter Sea. Everything, like they take the Winter Sea as the fixed thing here. Um, the Winter Sea is a novel that is set in 1707 at the time of, um, the invasion attempt, the Franco-Jacobite invasion attempt um, that was designed to put uh, James VIII back on the throne, the Jacobite King James VIII back on the throne. And it's a dual time novel and it deals with ancestral memory and and the heroine is a, a Canadian writer, historical fiction writer who has gone to 
to slains to um, um, research the novel that she's writing. Um, so if you take that as sort of the fixed point of this series, The Vanished Days has overlapping um, time periods in 1707 with that, but it also has action that goes on before that, and a few of the same characters appear in, you know, when they're younger. So it's a sort of prequel, sort of companion novel, but they're all linked. But Slane's Castle doesn't appear in it, so I, you know, it, it's not technically a Slane's novel. I would imagine over on Goodreads, they're going to count it as a Slane's novel. They'll probably call it Slane's something. But my my publisher has decided that they're going to link everything together as the Scottish series. So this is where Scottish series comes in. But then what do you call it? Do you call it Scottish series one because it's earlier? Do you call it Scottish series three because it's published third? I don't know. I just sit back and write the books and everybody else calls them what they <laughs> calls them what they are. You don't have to have read any other book in order to read The Vanished Days. It stands alone. That, you that's, don't, what, uh, yeah. that, that's what I thought is uh, it, it yeah. very much felt like a standalone, but it's a complete what, standalone. You will so, if you have read The Winter Sea you will find some familiar faces in it. Okay. If you read this one and then read The Winter Sea, you will find some familiar faces in The Winter Sea. Um, if you have a choice of reading, if you if you are sitting holding The Winter Sea and The Firebird together, my advice would be to read The Winter Sea first because there is a teeny tiny spoiler um, that, or something that will have a little more impact if you read the winter sea before the firebird but you don't have to because i purposely wrote all the books to stand alone because i don't like people having to read a book before reading another book you know it's not nice but what happens in my with my characters i don't know if that ha if this has happened with yours yet uh, it may um but my characters all tend to um because a lot of them are a lot of my books are set in the same time period um sort of the, let's say, from the mid-1600s through to the mid-1700s. So what happens is I'll, I'll write a book and the characters will get released into the world. Um, and then they start wandering about in wherever they are, this nether sphere or somewhere. And I'll write another book and I'll need you know, a spy or a vicar or somebody. And one of the former characters will just walk in and <laughs> yes. and they just appear on the page. And and it's it's kind of very Anthony Trollovish. Like they just kind of, you know, like they're in this they're in this other they're in this other place. It's it's like having a little um repertory troupe that just kind of wanders about with me and and um is in fact for the vanished days, one of the characters just walked in and sat down and started um doing his thing and i see it like a film and i didn't even know he, who he was and i was writing him and i i it sounds very strange but i was writing him and i knew like i had the last name and everything and i didn't even know he, who he was until about midway through the book when i put the last name together and realized he was related to characters from an earlier book and went oh oh okay so that's who you are and um so it can get really complicated in this, you know, greater fictional world. And then because I often write dual time stories with a modern day component, the modern day characters will do this to me too. So sometimes I'll get readers writing to me saying, can you draw me a map of who's who? And I was like, I'd really love to, but I don't even sometimes know who belongs where. Um, so maybe one day a reader will do that maybe one day a reader will draw a map of who belongs where and who came out of what book and and wandered into which other one um because i never know when they're going to do what it's it keeps it exciting and keeps it really fun for me because i never know where they're going to go so what i'm hearing is the susanna kearsley reader's companion is uh mm. it, it is coming one day one day, yeah, yeah, <laughs> probably not written by me, because <laughs> because readers are always much much more clever than me. They'll they'll spot somebody in the, you know, in a chapter that that I missed. 
Well, The Vanished Days is available everywhere now when you're hearing this. Uh, this is such an immersive book. If you want to go on an adventure uh, you know, from the comfort of your reading chair, this is a must-have uh, for your collection. Go pick it up today. We're going to put links in the show notes where you can get in a hardcover or Kindle edition. Uh, Susanna, if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all of your back catalog and you know start a new series and and all of that fun stuff where can they connect with you online oh uh the probably the easiest place is just go to my website just start with my website which is um uh susannacaresley.com um and through that if they down at the bottom of the home page are all the little icons for all my social media stuff i'm on twitter a lot more than i ought to be um, I don't, I'm not that great on Instagram. I should be, but I'm not that great on Instagram. So Twitter is where you're mo most often find me, but I do also have a Facebook page and I try to post there fairly regularly. Um, but Twitter is, is sort of more me. Um, um, and, uh, I have a, a sort of intermittent blog on my website but also on the website what you will find if you're not sure whether you're going to like the style of my writing uh there is a books tab on the website and you can pull down um the books tab and it will lead you to pages for each of the books you can learn more about the book you can sample a couple of chapters for free you can um I have galleries of if you've already read the book or are reading the book I have galleries of photos from I do on-site research for all of the books I like to go I, I have to go wander around the places that I'm writing about it's part of my process it gets the characters moving for me so I take a lot of photographs and I I put up a sampling of some of those photographs on the website so you'll be able to see some of the images um, of the places that I'm writing about and and uh, if there's a audiobook available sometimes there's a sample of that up there as well Excellent. We'll put links to all those places where where people can connect with you there. Susanna, this has been so much fun chatting. We're going to send everyone to pick up their copy of The Vanished Days. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Oh, well, thank you so much, Hank. It's just been a pleasure talking to you. You have a wonderful day. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Glebe's The Jason Crane Series. I was 10 years old when I saw my first ghost. The year was 1770. My father was a barber. He kept a small shop at the Kuenhoven Inn, where the King's Road met the Old Loop. Our modest home lay to the north, between the inn and the hanging tree. A simple box of pine boards, whitewashed with crushed oyster shell, one room with a spinning wheel for mother, a chair for father, and up a ladder of branches, a garret where my parents slept. I slept on the floor below, alongside my little brother, Hans, five years younger than I. Our floor sloped toward the Hudson, so that when Hans rolled over in his sleep, he often went on rolling and couldn't stop, collecting splinters and grievances. Yet on this particular night, he slept peacefully, and I was the fitful one. A mouse had taken shelter in our wall, fleeing the October chill. It scritched and scratched, nibbling a nest for itself, the sound thrilled me. I possessed a vivid mind, full of toadstools and bullfrogs and lightning storms, and so imagined a skeleton writhed in the wood, the bones of Anne Underhill, perhaps, murdered by Indians at Spook Rock. I'd heard that tale from my father, who reveled in the Dutch superstitions. He would gather us to fireside on winter nights and spin tales of the Heer of Dunderberg, that storm king who rattled our white windows of the Lady of Raven Rock, who died in snowfall, pining for her lover, of trolls beneath the Penny Bridge and hobgoblins in the Hanging Tree. He'd filled my head with such dark romance that I lay waiting for Anne's little finger bones to drag me off to some bloody fate. I rather hoped she would. A cloud cleared the moon, and a square of light fell on my mother's spinning wheel. The sharp spindle glinted, and the wheel began to turn, without touch. A figure appeared before me, as through a mist, a gray head bent to the work. She fixed me with eyes black as open graves and whispered in a low, guttural hiss. 
spin, or you shall not eat. I cried out and fell to my pallet, arms over my head. Hans awoke, lost his balance, and rolled away, bleeding with pain as he struck the riverside wall. Father emerged above. Agatha, what is wrong? There's a ghost, Papa. A ghost, help me. Hans laughed despite his bruises, and Mother moaned and ordered us to sleep. But Papa descended and took my hands, his blue eyes twinkling. What did you see? An old woman. She said, spin or you shall not eat. Oh, he raised a candle beneath his chin. You saw old Willow. She lived here long ago, when this was the home of Isaac Hart, our candle maker. Her husband was killed by savages. Hart took her in at the request of Lord Phillips, who paid a token sum for her upkeep. But Hart was greedy and kept the money for himself. He never fed her unless she spun. So Willow spun and spun and spun like a spider, year by year, growing old and blind and falling to waste. She died at that spinning wheel, fell over one day, and the spindle pierced her heart. Hans screamed and hid beneath the table. Mother appeared above. Daniel Van Ripper, you are a fool. I kissed Papa's fingers, for I loathed that spinning wheel. I'd be no toothless ghost, spinning and haunting little girls. I felt pity for such a spirit and gratitude to have her example before me, stealing my resolve. Every night thereafter, I would leave a crust of bread for old Willow and sleep with one eye open in case she came to spin for me again.